Hi guys, welcome back. We shall now be discussing MCQs of the recently conducted FMG June 2022 exam. It was very hot day, 4th of June and the temperature was going up to 44 degrees Celsius. So if you are going to be sitting again in a FMG exam in the month of June, then you not only need to be mentally strong to be able to handle the exam, but you also need to be physically strong so as to ha handle the extreme heat because lots of time in the examination centers, the air conditioning may not be perfect. So at this moment only, if you're listening to this discussion, I want to sensitize you to the fact that the accuracy with which you need to answer the questions has to be the same, whether you're sitting with a fan or without a fan, or whether you're without, with the air conditioner support or you're without an air conditioner support, even if sweat is dripping from your forehead, you should still be able to answer this ECG. Though luckily this ECG that came was a narrow QRS complex tachycardia and was very identical to what I have discussed in the app. So let's just zoom in to this image and we'll be able to get a better idea. First and the foremost thing in any ECG that you're supposed to do is look at lead number two and then you are supposed to check out the heart rate of the patient by calculating the RR interval. In this particular ECG, I can say that the RR interval is constant. There will be something in the range of about 1.5 large squares separating the R and the R waves. So the heart rate of this patient is pretty fast. It's uh, approximately 200 beats per minute and the second thing that is very characteristic is that the RS complex you see there's no Q wave that is visible R wave which is going up and then the S wave are literally jumping on each other so all of my students agreed to the fact that the QRS complex of the patient was very narrow normally the QRS complex should fit between two to two and a half small squares but in this case you can see it's literally one single square in which the R and the S wave is present then there was no P wave present there was a hidden P wave hidden P wave because when the heart will beat very fast in most of the supraventricular tachycardias what happens is that when the heart will be beating very fast then the T wave of the previous complex and the P wave of the next complex mentally visualize the T wave of the previous complex and the P wave of the subsequent complex will merge with each other so that is why I use this phrase hidden P wave in the patient and along with this what you can also notice is presence of some T wave inversion with respect to the chest leads of the patient and I can also highlight that there is some magnitude of ST segment depression. ST depression happens to be present and this is again what I got as a feedback from a lot of students that sir because it was ST depression we thought it could be something related to coronary artery disease per se. They thought in terms of unstable angina or even MI. The reason why we get a ST depression in a patient of PSVT is because suddenly the heart is accelerating. So this sudden acceleration of the heart will cause problems because it will cause an increase in the oxygen consumption of the heart and this increase in oxygen consumption per se is the main reason why ST depression can be present. So if I summarize all the findings in this particular ECG, narrow QRS complex tachycardia, hidden P waves, ST depression, all of these features points towards the diagnosis of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Option number A, ventricular fibrillation, there would be only twitching, there would be no P, Q, R, S, T waves. Ventricular tachycardia will appear in the form of a broad QRS complex with a very characteristic sign that I've tried to show here. This notch that I've shown here is what is called as Josephson sign. In atrial fibrillation, the highlight is that there would be an irregular RR interval. So a lot of guys made a mistake here with respect to especially option number D that because they found that P wave was not present, they decided to answer it as atrial fibrillation. But for atrial fibrillation, one of the most important diagnostic criteria is irregular RR interval. The distance between the R and the R waves should vary, which was constant in the ECG given in the exam. So that is why by exclusion also the answer to this question will be option number B. Moving to the subsequent one, a patient complains of palpitations. On examination, there's an irregularly irregular pulse present. That's the very characteristic terminology that you guys should be familiar with. And I've discussed this in the main section of the app also, that whenever even in rapid revision, irregularly irregular pulse is a feature in which a patient would be having multiple ectopic foci in the left atria. And because of this multiple ectopic foci which are present in the left atria of the patient, there would be a fast beating heart but it will be variable frequency of firing as a result of which the heart rate will also vary. So in these patients, the correct answer for this question is option number A 
and lot of guys they said sir absent p wave was okay but absent p wave is not a uh, i would say absent p wave can also be found in sick sinus syndrome like if the sa node is not functioning no so if a person is having sick sinus even then absent p wave can be present then you can be having absent p wave even in a patient of hyperkalemia so there are three conditions very characteristically discussed in the app where we have is absent p wave sick sinus syndrome then is hyperkalemia and then would be atrial fibrillation because of which the answer to this question would be option number a moving ahead uh, this was just a note from my student who actually just said that these questions were present uh, the subsequent question said a patient with diabetes mellitus is having a skin lesion that is necrolytic migratory erythema now the first thought process to every student was that sir because diabetes mellitus was written we were searching for acanthosis nigricans or in diabetes mellitus there could be terms like diabetic nephropathy or necrobiosis lipidoica diabeticorum but this patient was talking about this very peculiar lesion well most of them focused on this word which was the correct thing to do but then diabetes mellitus also had to be considered the answer to this question can never be insulinoma because in option number a the blood sugar of the patient will be lesser when it comes to vipoma most of the patients of vipoma will be called as uh, or in fact you know the stool of a person of a vipoma vip is vasoactive intestinal polypeptide so the stool of these patients will be just like a stool of a cholera patient so that is where the term used for this is pancreatic cholera so i mean when it comes to vipoma the usual question that is asked is with respect to secretory diarrhea usually it is asked with respect to hypokalemia that can be seen in these patients we are left with two glucagonoma and somatostatinoma the correct answer for this one is option number b in fact this question is discussed even in dermatology as well and even in the roots routine section of the app if you focus on this topic that is pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors then in fact right in the beginning you know i have described insulinoma and after that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors we have talked about glucagonoma where a migratory necrolytic erythema is present moving to the subsequent question he said you are somewhere and you saw a guy collapse and you have started giving cpr in this particular road traffic accident the rescue team has arrived with all the equipment which of the following is correct about their options now when you scan through the options quickly you will notice one option saying stop cpr i mean the moment you stop cpr the circulation to the brain will hamper so option number c is what i would say is outrageously a incorrect statement d says hand over the patient and leave now suppose this question was with respect to bystander cpr like you know let us say you are a non medical person you are a doctor right so i am saying just assume you are a non medical person and you are trying to give cpr to somebody obviously you will not know what should be the exact depth of sternal depression what is the frequency at which cpr should be given so if it is bystander cpr being talked about like if he mentioned that a bystander is giving a cpr and you as a doctor are arriving here the situation was different you were there and then a specialist team also came over but suppose the question was regarding bystander cpr and now you as a doctor are arriving then you will ask this person to step back and you would take charge so option number d is valid for if a non medico was giving cpr whereas in this particular case he mentioned you are the doctor who is giving the cpr you are left between a and b a says continue five rounds of cpr followed by application of aed my point is why do you use a aed per se the reason why you use a aed is to terminate a tachyarrhythmia which could either be ventricular fibrillation or it could be a pulseless ventricular tachycardia if you are supposed to terminate these tachyarrhythmias you need to deploy a automated external defibrillator which would be deployed as early as possible i think i have given you the hint for the answer but then if you focus on this video of basic life support at the 27th minute in fact i'm telling you the time zone also at the 27th minute this is what we are discussing what we are discussing is you are giving cpr to a patient the aed has arrived i have said use aed immediately on arrival i mean you are not going to wait for the cycle to be completed i mean the cycle one the one team is giving cpr that's okay but you have to deploy the paddles of the aed asap as early as possible so that it can detect a shockable rhythm and it can deliver a dc shock because the only way to cure this patient 
is to deliver a dc shock if it is asystole the computer will itself not deliver a dc shock in the patient so if you look at the two options here option a said you are gonna wait for the five rounds of cpr which will be i would say a waste of time because aad is the one that would be treating the patient so you are depriving the patient of the proper medical care you will continue with cpr do not discontinue cpr but one medical personnel who has arrived this uh, acls team which has arrived they are the ones who would be responsible now for deploying the paddles so that a 200 joules biphasic shock can be delivered and the patient's uh, chances of survival are increased the next question talks about a young adult with gastric outlet obstruction and presence of vomiting and he says which of the following fluid is to be used Whenever you read about chronic vomiting, then all patients of chronic vomiting will be having dehydration. Because of dehydration, the RAS system of these patients would be activated because there is loss of fluid from the body. Whenever there is going to be activation of the RAS system, aldosterone will be increased. And what aldosterone does is that it promotes urinary loss of potassium and hydrogen. If I say there is an exaggerated urinary loss of hydrogen, then urinary loss of hydrogen would mean that my patient, my client would be ending up with development of a metabolic alkalosis and I am not going to give Ringer lactate in a patient of metabolic alkalosis because Ringer lactate contains lactate which generates bicarbonate. If a doctor by mistake will be giving Ringer lactate to this patient, then there will be more bicarbonate in the body and that will worsen the metabolic alkalosis component. So Ringer lactate is not given. The fluid of choice for management of metabolic alkalosis is normal saline. You can go through the main videos also. I'm just showing you a snapshot. In any chapter with metabolic alkalosis, we have discussed either it's going to be saline responsive metabolic alkalosis or it's going to be a saline non-responsive metabolic alkalosis. So when we talk about saline responsive, I have specifically spoken regarding gastric outlet obstruction in a patient. And that's the main way. I mean, the metabolic alkalosis component of the patient can be cured, which is why the answer to this question is option number B. And I had people answering even A, C and D as well. But please listen to the statement of mine, which I'm repeating. Fluid of choice for metabolic acidosis, Ringer lactate. But the fluid of choice for metabolic alkalosis happens to be normal saline. We move on to the subsequent one, where a question said a patient of chronic stable angina is having signs of heart failure. Which of the following drugs will increase the survival? The bottom line is, if you are going to use nifedipin, calcium channel blocker, short-acting calcium channel blocker, the problem is that it will increase the heart rate. If you increase the heart rate, it will increase the oxygen consumption of the heart and that is going to cause a deterioration of the patient. Digoxin. In pharmacology, it looks like digoxin is the best way for managing the patient. But then the problem with digoxin is, again, it increases the oxygen consumption of the heart. Imagine the heart is failing and you are trying to upgrade the oxygen consumption. You are literally forcing the heart to work harder when it really, really cannot. We are left with the lisinopril and torsemide. Now, torsemide is very, very good for management of the pulmonary edema component. It is very good for the pedal edema component. I mean, anytime a heart failure patient will be having features of congestion, so torsemide will work. But my main objective in any heart failure patient is to decrease the preload and the afterload in the heart. That is what is going to make the heart able to perform longer and you would have a longevity increase in the person. The main drug that is used in management of heart failure patients is A plus B. If you focus on the video here, I have highlighted that in patients of chronic congestive heart failure, we shall be using ARNI. ARNI would mean angiotensin receptor blocker plus nephrilysin inhibitor that is sacubitril. So either we use a combination of the two that's going to be valsartan with sacubitril or we shall be using A plus B and this is the main strategy that you have because what is going to ACE inhibitor do? Decrease the preload and the afterload and what is going to beta blocker do? That is decrease of the heart rate and by beta blocker I don't mean a non-selective beta blocker I mean a cardio-selective beta blocker. So what are you going to use there? You can be using metoprolol in these patients or we can be using carbidolol which will be having an alpha blocking action as well. So coming back to the options of this question, the answer to this question is ACE inhibitors which improve the longevity of the patient. The next question talked about a smoker male who has difficulty in swallowing and is most likely to develop which of the following cancers. Uh, I have highlighted that all the lung cancers that begin with alphabet S. All the lung cancers that begin with alphabet S are related to cigarette smoking. 
and uh, the names are squamous cell and small cell cancer and which of the two is more common then squamous is obviously more common as compared to small cell cancer small cell cancer is aggressive if i talk about micrometastasis agreed small cell cancer but on a comparison basis overall the most common lung cancer is agreed adenocarcinoma no but adenocarcinoma does not begin with alphabet s adenocarcinoma is commonly seen in non smokers in fact the information to be remembered is the commonest lung cancer overall is found in non smoker it is this lung cancer is more common in female patients this lung cancer adenocarcinoma found in non smokers in females is usually peripheral in location whereas lung cancers that begin with alphabet s are related to cigarette smoking and are central in location squamous and small cell are central location the answer to this question is option number a a uh, easy one i would say then there was a question on hypoglossal nerve injury and the question said which of the following would be seen so i would request you to go to the stroke topic in the stroke topic we have discussed regarding medial medullary syndrome in medial medullary syndrome it is the 12th cranial nerve that gets involved and because of the involvement of the 12th cranial nerve what happens is that when you ask the patient to protrude his tongue then there is a ipsilateral same sided tongue deviation whenever you gonna read about you know damage to the brain we always think that if the damage is in the right side manifestations will occur contralateral but that is not valid for the tongue because there is a crossing over of the muscles of the tongue as well due to crossing over of the muscles of the tongue as well the message here is that the tongue will get deviated to the same side the correct answer for this question would be option number b tongue deviation to the same side not to the contralateral side because that's the normal thought process so a lot of people answered a as well and as far as uh, c and d are concerned they were dummy choices it's mainly that whenever there is a cns region either a deviation occurs to the same or to the contralateral side the logic here is agreed damage is in the brain but because of the crossing over of even the tongue muscles the manifestation occurs to the same side the next question talks about very classical i mean most guys said sir we remembered you when this question came because bp was low there was this peculiar word smooth heart sounds now normally we hear about muffled heart sounds normally we hear about diminished heart sounds but this time in the exam maybe this examiner decided to put some uh, fancy english term smooth heart sound what is trying to say is that the intensity is lesser why because there is fluid outside the heart in fact these three findings that i have written before you that the bp of the patient is less muffled heart sounds in a patient and absent by descent why absent by descent because heart will not be able to relax this is the left ventricle this is right ventricle this is atria Uh, this would be the venous return so please be patient while i just sketch it before you and this is the pericardial sac which would be having a large amount of fluid present now if you look at the diagrammatic representation that i made before you what's happening is that this fluid will exert pressure it is gonna press on the heart from outside so if you look at these arrows what i'm trying to show is that the filling of blood in the heart will be compromised and filling is the reason for development of wide descent in the jvp so that explains why if there is no filling there would be absent wide descent and the answer to this question would be given as cardiac tamponade most guys were able to pick up pick it up that the question was with respect to beck's triad where you always read about congested neck veins but instead of writing the word congested neck veins he used a technical term absent wide descent in fact this was a very important clinching point because when you will listen to me speaking in the topic of jvp i have always highlighted this that one you have to read about large a waves super large a waves and always read about absent wide descent which is a hot favorite with respect to mca screening exam every time there is a question on cardiac tamponade and every time we will ask you the details with respect to uh, the cardiac tamponade component and if you are in a rush then you can listen to the rapid revision component also in which cardiac tamponade topic is discussed extensively the next question said a chronic alcoholic patient with chronic liver disease so chronic word was coming two times one for describing that this guy is a chronic alcoholic a big time loser and then a loser as well and a loser as well and then he is suffering from liver cirrhosis he is having sudden hematemesis the question said what is the most likely cause option a said mallory vs now for mallory vs to occur in a person you need retching there was no mention of any retching you also need usually multiple episodes of vomiting like the person came first time when he vomits no problems but then he is going to vomit with force there is going to be retching present so most of the time for mallory vs there has to be some kind of a trigger 
there has to be multiple episodes of vomiting retching documented and if he is describing a alcoholic he would have sent to binge, binge drinking like this known alcoholic he went to a party with his friends where free alcohol was available so he is binging on alcohol that binge drinking would contribute to that submucosal tear and a malaria syndrome occurring in a person but the point is none of this information was given which tells us the fact that the answer for this question will mainly be based on a complication that occurs in patients of chronic liver disease that is portal hypertension and you know that portal hypertension will cause esophageal varices once the pressure goes more than 12 they'll pop off and therefore the person will develop a bleeding esophageal varices c said perforation of peptic ulcer for this you need guarding in the abdomen you need rigidity in the abdomen you need rebound tenderness to be written and nothing related to rebound tenderness or anything even closely remotely related to it was present coming to d boer half syndrome boer half syndrome will have a very classical finding of subcutaneous emphysema if you have listened in rapid revision or in the main videos you will hear me talking about macular striae in macular striae we always have subcutaneous emphysema another feature that you get in these patients is also development of chest pain why because esophagus will burst so the saliva of this guy the food of uh, the food whatever he had consumed and air will escape into the mediastinum the saliva and the food and the alcohol will cause chemical mediastinitis and that will explain the chest pain occurring in these patients because there would be a rupture of the esophagus boer half is esophageal rupture it causes pneumomediastinum it causes chest pain in a patient which was not described the only thing that was described was a sudden onset hematemesis which tells us the fact that uh, there would be a esophageal dilated vein which would have popped off and could have resulted in the following manifestations in this person the next question talks about uh, a person who brings his father who became unconscious while working in the hot sun at 44 degrees celsius in a june afternoon with a heat stroke if a person will suffer from heat stroke slash heat exhaustion the question says which of the following will not be seen uh the concept is that when do you get heat stroke when the cooling mechanisms of the body will fail when i say the cooling mechanisms of the body will fail the cooling mechanism would mean that there would be sweating occurring in a person and the evaporation of sweat results in cooling of the body so we all know that the cooling mechanism of the body is evaporation of the sweat the point that i would like to make here is that if the evaporation of the sweat is present the body gets cooled but what happens if the sweating stops then the cooling mechanism of the body is switched off i said if there is so much of loss of water from the body like this guy was weak working at 44 degrees celsius so he is going to be sweating profusely and he is not drinking water so once there is a critical fluid deficit occurring in a person sweating will stop and that is when the cooling mechanism will stop and that is when the body temperature will begin to rise so the question says which of the following will not be seen in this patient the word was not be seen and that's going to be presence of sweating the person would be dry there would be headache there would be nausea that's all due to dehydration component hypotension is also explained by the dehydration component because there is extensive loss of water from the body in the form of profuse sweating in this person before he went into heat stroke the trigger for heat stroke in a person first you have heat exhaustion it can cause heat cramps the person will lie down on the floor and he will say that uh, i just need rest give me some water but if he is not given water gradually you will notice that the altered sensorium part would start happening i mean you know human body has great powers of healing so the person will try to get to the source of water if he is not able to get water he lie down under maybe the shade of a tree but then gradually his sensorium will deteriorate so hypotension is explained by the dehydration component of the patient which is why the answer to this question will work out to option number b the next question said j wave is seen in now all of you are aware of the j point and this is representation of acg right at the end of the s wave right where the s wave will end that is what you call as the j point but in patients of hypothermia the heart will be beating slower height of the p wave might be lesser there would be a prolonged pr interval there would be a broad qrs complex and then right at the end of the s wave i have drawn a abnormal wave present here this is t the wave which i am putting the arrow at this particular moment is the one which was asked in the exam this is going to be the j wave and this is going to be encountered in those patients who are suffering from hypothermia so in the previous years in the exam he gave a scenario of like a soldier posted at siachen glacier and he is having a dangerous hypothermia 
that is when this J wave would be coming up in the patient. The correct answer for this question is option number A. Moving ahead, uh, this is just a snapshot from, uh, in fact, this is an image from the snapshot uh, where I've described these abnormalities which are seen at the end of the S, like epsilon wave is also found at the end of the S wave. This is seen in arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Delta wave is found in WPW, but our question was regarding Osborne wave slash J wave, which is a feature with respect to hypothermia in a patient. The answer to this question is option number A. Then we are going to talk about the standard favorite question of MCI people. Female patient having fever for past three days and she cannot touch the neck to the chest like this. She is not able to flex her neck. So the question spoke regarding nuchal rigidity in the patient. The lumbar puncture of the patient was done. The CSF findings was opening pressure is elevated. Appearance was white cloudy. Turbid word was not given white cloudy. Neutrophils were predominantly seen. Now, if you focus on this word, neutrophils are the main finding present. It would mean that this would be in favor of bacterial meningitis. Even the sugar was fairly less. Proteins were elevated. Some people said protein was about 60 to 70 grams. So, okay, no problems. That would not change the answer because we base our answer on the cells and the sugar value. The bacteria will consume the sugar. The neutrophils will consume the sugar. So, hypoglycorrhachia, CSF sugar becoming lesser is one of the characteristic features that you encounter in a bacterial meningitis. And why it is not tubercular meningitis? Because tubercular meningitis will usually be having a longer history, maybe spanning over a couple of weeks. Whereas in this case, the patient was sick for only three days. Then in tubercular meningitis, the color of the CSF is straw colored. That uh, color was described as white and cloudy. And then another feature that is always asked with respect to tubercular meningitis is cobweb coagulum is present in the test tube like a basketball net. So that would be going in favor of tubercular meningitis. I mean, if these points were given, then I would have thought in terms of option number B. C and D, the main point against them is CSF sugar is normal. Whereas when it comes to bacterial meningitis, the CSF sugar in the patient is dramatically, I said, dramatically reduced. In fact, the only scenario where CSF sugar can be zero is what was asked this time, acute bacterial meningitis, which could be due to pneumococcus or could be due to meningococcus. And uh, this is just a snapshot of what we've discussed in the routine section in the app. That's going to be large number of neutrophils present with very low sugar values and elevated protein. This is a table which is always, always asked in the exam. Note down the details of this table, stick it on somewhere, keep reading it daily. The logic for this is present in the main section of the app where, with respect to the sugar values and how to differentiate between viral meningitis versus tubercular meningitis. One difference is simple, no? Sugar will be normal in vir viruses don't eat sugar, no? But in tubercular meningitis, because it is a bacteria, sugar will be less. But how do you differentiate between acute bacterial and tubercular meningitis? It is number of cells, neutrophils versus lymphocytes, and also the value protein per se. I mean, if the protein is like uh, going up to 500 or maybe going up to 1000 and there's a Quab web coagulum developing, then it favors tubercular meningitis. The next question was uh, with respect to high altitude and I actually got two versions of this question. So I'll discuss both of them with you. The question said during Everest climbing, a climber on the mountain at a height of about 5,000 meters, strong guy went up to 5,000 meters, is having headache, dizziness and is not able to climb further. He's just saying, I just can't do anything. He's just sitting down there and the fellow climbers are in a fix. What to do to leave him here or to continue with their accent? Luckily, there was a medical team also posted there. You were the doctor, you were the medical officer there. And the question said, which of the following findings will indicate the development of high altitude cerebral edema? The concept behind this question is that if somebody will be having swelling in the brain, he would be having disorientation. He will not recognize his friends, he will not recognize his family members, he might try to injure himself, he might show altered mentation. Option A said desaturation, that is the reason. These patients, the higher you go up, there would be less oxygen available in the environment and that would cause hypobaric hypoxia. This hypobaric hypoxia is the reason for development of acute mountain sickness, which includes terms like high altitude pulmonary edema and includes terms like high altitude cerebral edema in a person. Option A and option number B are related to pathophysiology of the disease. They're not the manifestations. How as a doctor will you pick up that somebody is having a cerebral edema, 
if he is not able to see properly if he is not able to recognize his friends and he is not able to tell you who you are i mean somebody can look at you and say okay you are a doctor because you are having a stethoscope around his neck he is not able to pick up that you are a healthcare worker he is just staring at you so altered mentation is the clinical presentation of the disease when it comes to retinal hemorrhage retinal hemorrhage is also seen in this condition and with respect to retinal hemorrhage i want to tell you that there would be uh, i mean bursting of the retinal blood vessels due to damage to the a uh, blood retinal barrier like we have blood brain barrier in in high altitude cerebral edema it is blood brain barrier that is damaged similarly retinal hemorrhage is seen if the blood retinal barrier is affected so yeah we do have blurring people can go blind also so if the question said blindness and blurring retinal hemorrhage if you saying cns manifestation altered mentation a lot of my students they said sir the question was not what is the finding that you will see though personally i think from a clinician perspective that is going to ask you, you know if you as a doctor are examining somebody what finding will you see but some guy said no sir in the question there was nothing like what will be the examination finding it was the reason i mean it was a pure physiology based question then the answer would be given as desaturation because there would be a hypobaric hypo hypoxia which is responsible for the manifestations in the patient other options were like uh, increased blood pressure that can happen but it 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 will not explain the severity of the cerebral edema i mean hypoxia causes dilatation of brain blood vessels and that excessive flow to the brain you see what's happening is in the brain the blood vessels are dilated so the excess blood flow to the brain is causing fluid to leak out due to hydrostatic pressure which is causing cerebral edema in this guy c says carbon monoxide poisoning which is anyway dummy choice and low sodium i mean we're not talking about electrolyte imbalance we're talking about hypobaric hypoxia which is the reason for development of high altitude cerebral edema the next question was a abg based one where he said comment on the abg report of the patient the ph was 7.28 ph was less and the pco2 of the patient was elevated you can see that the arrows are going in opposite direction the moment the arrows are going in opposite direction it means a respiratory problem in the patient so thankfully he did not even ask about compensation phase the question simply said what is the interpretation the answer would be given as respiratory acidosis the correct answer for this one is option number b family member is volunteering for a blood donation for a person with road traffic accident before giving blood transfusion which of the following is not tested so as a doctor you are responsible for ensuring that a patient gets tested blood he should not get infected blood you are going to ensure that the patient is not suffering from hiv you are going to ensure that the patient is not suffering from hepatitis b or hepatitis c but hepatitis a is transmitted transmitted by feco oral route so you would not be concerned with respect to hepatitis a at the moment because hepatitis a the main route of transmission is not parenteral it's not a blood borne pathogen it's feco oral transmission the answer to this question is option number c a 50 year old patient presents with palpitations episodic headache and sweating episodes very classical phd manifestations palpitations then would be headache in a patient due to hypertension then there would be diaphoresis that is excessive sweating so all the features are pointing towards presence of pheochromocytoma and the question assisted you further because he said that there is a left suprarenal mass which is identified in this patient so the diagnosis of this patient is already clear from the first line of the mcq he says what would you do to be sure from the biochemical perspective then you would be checking for venial mandelic acid though ideally for pheochromocytoma we should be doing urinary metanephrine levels in harrison he has mentioned urinary metanephrine levels and plasma metanephrine levels for identification of this patient but in robbins the textbook of pathology he still persists with that older term vanil mandelic acid which is also a end derivative with respect to norepinephrine and epinephrine metabolism which is produced in excess in this patient moving ahead a young 25 year old male normally they talk about a female here is saying this male has presented with ptosis which is worse in the evening and shows improvement in the morning so he's talking about diurnal variation i mean whenever you read a neurology question and he mentions a diurnal variation you know what to answer mahesh tanagaras in all neurological disorders either manifestations are there or they are not there no it's not that symptoms will be present in evening only they will not be in the morning 
in myasthenia gravis there are no symptoms in the morning no toothaches but the moment the patient starts going to office sitting in front of laptop playing around with or uh, playing a video game in a mobile phone focusing on the computer in front of him that is when this toothaches feature will develop and the question also mentioned regarding ice pack test traditionally we do a tensilon test but nowadays instead of tensilon test it is ice pack test which is being done there's a image of ice pack test which you can see is with respect to a myasthenia gravis patient when you put this ice pack the toothaches part begins to reduce and ice pack test has been found to be almost as equally efficacious as the tensilon test the question says what is the diagnosis of this patient though i think uh, the question was very self explanatory but still myasthenia gravis would be the best bet for this patient moving to the next question which has been wrongly answered at some forums so let me explain this to you a 60 year old man presents with two month history of weakness and pallor first of all i want to tell you that you never diagnose a blood cancer as acute and chronic on the basis of history a lot of guys do this if they fit as within 6 months it is acute leukemia after 6 months it is chronic leukemia come on man we are living in the 21st century we rely on investigations to diagnose a acute leukemia versus a chronic leukemia duration does not matter per abdomen examination shows a moderate splenomegaly some people said mild splenomegaly splenomegaly is usually what you read with respect to chronic myeloid leukemia but i'm still not saying it is cml let's focus on the reports there is a decrease in the rbc count hemoglobin is therefore lesser there is a increase in the tlc of the patient so it is report is like this hp is less tlc total leukocyte count is more traditional for any blood cancer the platelet count of this patient is at the moment normal but when the peripheral smear of the patient was done then there were certain percentages of these cells given metamyelocytes myeloblasts values were given and the my point is that normally in peripheral smear you do not have immature cells now suppose in this mcq listen to my words very carefully i'll use a different color to highlight it suppose in this question the question said bone marrow examination of the patient shows presence of myeloblast 45% myeloblast more than 20% is a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia in acute myeloid leukemia we have a maturational arrest maturational arrest would mean that only a single cell only a single cell would be the one which would be multiplying again and again but in chronic myeloid leukemia we always have what is called as shift to the left by meaning the word a meaning of the word shift to the left is that immature cell lines like myelocytes metamyelocytes because in cml we don't have a maturational arrest no it's a clonal expansion of all the previous precursor cells so all of them start appearing in the blood which has jacked up the tlc of this guy the correct answer for this question is not acute myeloid leukemia it's not about two months it's not about splenomegaly guys it's about the finding which is given that is percentage of immature cells are present in a peripheral smear you do not diagnose acute leukemia in peripheral smear you diagnose acute leukemia by bone marrow aspiration so if you're going to read this wrong answer that myeloblast are given 45% and it's going to be acute myeloid leukemia no guys apart from this additional information is also given no and in acute myeloid leukemia do you have a splenomegaly no you have a hepatosplenomegaly in acute myeloid leukemia you have gingival involvement you have dic present there are so many other features in acute myeloid leukemia which would cause progressive severe deterioration in two months period i mean aml is a horrible disease as i mean any blood cancer is bad but aml is a horrible disease in two months it will just i would say knock out the patient not that person will die because you are there to save him but then the condition of patient will become very bad but in chronic myeloid leukemia the organomegaly part is only splenomegaly you don't have a hepatomegaly you don't have a lymphadenopathy on basis of the findings of splenomegaly and shift to left there are two points on which i have based my diagnosis and there's no bone marrow aspiration given it's a peripheral smear finding which makes the diagnosis as cml the next question said a 20 year old hypertensive patient is brought to the emergency room with palpitations and shortness of breath blood pressure is 210 by 120 so there is a hypertensive encephalopathy occurring in a in fact he himself mentioned that encephalopathy and he said all of the following drugs can be used in this patient except so first we need to understand why did he become unconscious i mean bp is high it's understandable why is he becoming unconscious is he having stroke no if it is stroke then he would have said it no intraparenchymal hemorrhage intracerebral hemorrhage what is happening in this guy is that when the blood pressure becomes very highly elevated there is a development of spasm of the cerebral blood vessels this spasm 
that occurs of the cerebral blood vessels is the one which is responsible for this high uh, loss of consciousness of this person. This spasm of cerebral blood vessels explains that the movement you will, I mean, this explains why, you know, the lowering of BP is important in these patients because when you will lower the blood pressure of this patient, he will gradually start regaining sense. So you can be using a calcium channel blocker by the name of Nicardipine. In fact, this is one of the preferred agents that are used in this patient. Apart from this, I can also use Esmolol. The logic is that lots of time when you use a Nicardipine or you use Clavidipine, then there can be a complication or side effect of reflex tachycardia. You very well know that long-acting calcium channel blocker, they do not cause long-acting CCB, they do not cause tachycardia. But when you use a short-acting one like clavidipine and nicardipine, then it can cause a, a reflex tachycardia. And tachycardia in this patient will increase oxygen consumption of the heart. So to neutralize this reflex tachycardia, which is a side effect that can be seen with calcium channel blockers, to neutralize this reflex tachycardia, what I'll be giving to this patient is short acting beta blocker. This short acting beta blocker is Esmolol. So the combination of the two why it is working is because I want to put less stress on the heart. Sodium nitroprusside can also be used in these patients. How? Because it will exhibit a vasodilator action. Though the problem with sodium nitroprusside is it can cause a sudden fall. So you can even have a brain infarction. So you need to be very judicious with the usage of sodium nitroprusside in these patients. The bottom line that I want you to understand is that B, C and D will lower the blood pressure. All of these are anti-hypertensive drugs. But mannitol, where is it used? Mannitol is used for raised ICP. Now, please appreciate the question was not talking about brain hemorrhage and raised ICP. Suppose there was bursting of any blood vessel of the brain. I never said bursting, no. I said spasm. If there's a bursting of any blood vessel of the brain, then bursting of any blood vessel of the brain will cause brain hemorrhage and it will cause a raised intracranial pressure. So option number A would be valid if it was hemorrhagic stroke. If he talks about you know brain hemorrhage, there's postering occurring in a patient, there is obtundation, there is decreased sensorium of the patient, yeah, mannitol is on. But the question was not on brain hemorrhage. It was on hypertensive encephalopathy where there is a spasm. And to neutralize the spasm, three antihypertensive drugs are mentioned here, out of which the preferred one is nicardipine. And beta blocker short acting one is given just to neutralize the reflex tachycardia. And even in the main section in the app, I have described, uh, if you listen to the hypertension topic, uh, I have described with respect to the various drugs which can be used as molol, nicardipine. In fact, nicardipine is coming most of the time in the list now. So that's one of the important agents that would be used for management of these patients. The next question talked about GCA of a road traffic accident patient. The value is 10 and this implies what kind of a traumatic brain injury. So it's an overlap with surgery. I would say that uh, how will I work out that this is moderate because severe is comatose patient. You very well know coma begins at a score of equal to or less than 8. Coma is a score of less than or equal to 8. So that's going to be severe. So the value is given as 10. So it's a little more than that. So I'll say it is moderate traumatic brain injury. Mild is 13 to 15 GCS score. The correct answer for this question would be option number B. Then this was a very easy question with the pharmacological overlap treatment of hyperthyroidism in the first trimester. The drug that you shall be using in this patient is propylthiuracil because it is protein bound. I mean the problem with carbimazole, methimazole would be the problem of teratogenicity. I mean we do not use these drugs. In the, we can use these like I can say carbimazole is the preferred drug for hyperthyroidism in pregnancy when we talk about second and third trimester. But in the first trimester because of the teratogenicity aspect Related to option number B and C, we would not like to use it. We will use propyl thiuracil for the patient. So treatment of hyperthyroidism, please listen to it from the main lecture video. It's to just take 15 minutes, but you would be able to answer these questions relatively more accurately. The subsequent question said cat's crush disease would be caused by that would be Bartonella hensley. So relatively an easy question, whereas Bartonella quintana would be responsible for trench fever, which would also be referred sometimes as five day fever. The next question said a 25 year old male is trying to have a baby for last two years like he described a married man and then he said he is trying to have a kid for two years and he was documented to be azospermic. Now in this chap you are doing a general physical examination so you found he is having gynecomasia with scattered pubic hair and hypogonadism. So the movement you read regarding gynecomasia in a male patient, azospermia, hypogonadism, there is only one answer that would be Klinefelter. 
when it comes to down syndrome well that is ruled out because down syndrome will begin with mental retardation turner will be a female and down and edward syndrome the trisomy is they are mainly related to mental retardation and a pediatric presentation i mean if option was c or d then the question would have talked about a child whereas in our case it was a adult patient which is why the answer to this question is option number a which of the following drug is best for urate lowering therapy in tumor lysis syndrome the basic point is tumor lysis syndrome what's going to happen is that when you kill the cancer cells then the uric acid will be produced in large amounts you see cancer cell would be a large cell with a big nucleus and big nucleus means lots and lots of dna and when you break down this dna this is a cancer cell loaded with dna in fact i'll use a different color this is lots of dna when this dna breaks down it produces uric acid and that uric acid crystals will block the tubules of the kidney and will cause a development of acute tubular necrosis the kidneys of the patient will shut down i don't want that to happen so i have a couple of drugs at my disposal option number a says furosemide furosemide is something which will be contraindicated in this case because if you give furosemide it will cause dehydration it can rather worsen if you cause dehydration in this patient you could be causing worsening of the renal failure of the patient i mean already the kidney was not functioning now you're decreasing the renal blood supply also so if this question said which drug is not to be given in the patient it is furosemide we are left between febrexostat allopurinol and rasburicase for the patient for management of patients who are having tumor lysis syndrome first line approach is iv allopurinol but if allopurinol is not working then we will have to go in for usage of rasburicase on a comparison basis because the question was saying which of the following is best for rapid lowering of the of the levels of uric acid so we don't want acute tubular necrosis to occur so on a comparative basis between option number c and d rasburicase is much more efficacious but protocol wise we don't start with rasburicase we first give allopurinol to these patients iv we give a lots of iv fluids we hydrate these patients in advance we want brisk diuresis then you can give allopurinol to these patients if it is not working rasburicase because the question was having a pharmacological overlap which is why rasburicase has been answered here over and above allopurinol when would you answer febuxostat then i'll answer that also the drug of choice for management of a over producer with like in chronic gout no there is a over producer and under excretor so in over producer you use allopurinol now if a gout patient is having ckd then what you will do is that you will reduce the dose of allopurinol i mean in any patient having renal failure allopurinol can be used but it is for a ckd patient that allopurinol dosage has to be reduced because it won't get excreted by the kidney side effects will increase now suppose there is a gout patient is having chronic kidney disease and the question mentions that the estimated gfr of the patient is less than 30 the moment you read the statement that the estimated gfr of the patient is less than 30 that is when in these circumstances for these patients you would be using febuxostat so this is a urate lowering therapy definitely but febuxostat is answer in ckd with extremely low gfr that would be grade 4 gfr in a patient the question was not on ckd lot of guys know when they read about this tumor lysis syndrome to prevent renal damage they thought the question is on chronic kidney disease the question is on acute kidney injury due to uric acid crystals blocking the tubules so i would like to dissolve them i would like to destroy them immediately allopurinol will prevent the formation but rasburicase is going to destroy it which is why the answer to this question is option number d The subsequent question talks about a patient who is having morning time productive cough that is yellow and that increases on turning from left to right side. Now what he is talking about in this particular case is a chap with purulent bronchorrhea. Bronchorrhea means that there is increased lung secretions and because it's mentioned yellow so I'm taking that to be pus. So I said the patient is having dilated airways, extremely grossly distended dilated airways which are filled with pus. and when do you read about it you either read about that in chronic bronchitis or you read about that in bronchitis and well what is the significance i mean when i was doing a live session after the exam you will notice that on the live session one guy was saying sir what is the significance of this you know purulent bronchorrhea increasing from left to right then what i can say is suppose the left side of the lung is having more dilated airways and pus present when he will turn 
right this particular this particular if if you suppose i said dilated left side if you keep the left side dependent then the pus will gravitate deeper deeper inside and it will not come out but if you change position the same pus will tend to move to the contralateral side in the patient because of the positional issue this patient is having large airways filled with pus so if it's going to be lot of pus and let me say right dilated major bronchi when he will turn the pus will gravitate towards the left hand side because there's a focal accumulation of pus present so so much of pus that it can change position left lung to right lung right lung to left lung that would be with bronchiectasis only lung cancer will present mainly with weight loss and he will always talk about hemoptysis i mean lung cancer he should talk about cachexia progressive weight loss lung cancer he should talk about hemoptysis which was not given in the question asthma will be having mainly shortness of breath there was no shortness of breath described it was portland bronchorea pulmonary embolism is common after deep vein thrombosis so lot of guys solve this question by exclusion also and i want you to learn these exclusion skills so that you can answer the question appropriately the correct answer for this question is option number d the next question said a female washing a clothes and her hands in cold water exhibits color changes from white to red so this is a classical presentation of renaud's phenomenon where there is going to be change of color that's going to be initially the fingertip will become white because of the spasm then it will become blue and subsequently it will become red this color change is best managed or neutralized because there's a spasm present initially so to neutralize the spasm you would be using calcium channel blockers in the patient AC inhibitors are useful for control of hypertension. Pentoxifilin, this is what we use in thromboangitis obliterans. This is what we use in Burgess disease to improve the distal blood supply. And when it comes to fentolamine, well, fentolamine is useful for preoperative, just before surgery, just before surgery, if we are, you know, or I would say perioperative or intraoperative. So right at the time of surgery, like just before the surgery of a pheochromocytoma patient has just started. So we can give intramuscular fentolamine to prevent the rise of blood pressure of this patient. Though we can use sodium nitroglycide during surgery also. What I'm saying is we can give intramuscular fentolamine at the time of surgery to prevent the spike of BP because when the surgeon will handle the pheochromocytoma tumor, there will be a sudden increase in the blood pressure of this patient. There would be a spike. So to prevent the spike during pheochromocytoma surgery, surgery of pheochromocytoma that is when fentolamine which is a non-selective alpha blocker this non-selective alpha blocker neutralizes the vasoconstriction which is caused by catecholamines therefore the answer to this question will be option number beta remaining options have been ruled out now there were two questions on the topic of diabetes mellitus let us handle them one by one one said a diabetic patient is brought with complaints of vomiting and abdominal pain that standard presentation of diabetic ketoacidosis Patient is found to be hyperventilating with a fruity sweet breath. That is again uh, what we can call as small breathing. BP of the patient is low because of the dehydration component. This is because these patients have protracted vomiting. They also have osmotic diuresis. So due to combination of the osmotic diuresis component and the vomiting component, the BP of this patient is low. Blood sugar is 320 milligram percent and urinary ketones are present. What is the next step in the management of this patient? Option A says IV insulin drip. That's the treatment of choice for this patient. But initially, I need to handle the BP, which is low. I need to give fluids to this patient. In any patient with diabetic ketoacidosis, what do you do first? You give normal saline to this patient. And before you start, before you start insulin drip, you always have to check potassium values because potassium values will become lesser when you give insulin drip, but at presentation, they are elevated. Remember, I've told you in the routine videos, pH is inversely related to potassium. So whenever pH is low, potassium is elevated. There's a redistribution of potassium. When you give insulin, it will go inside cells. But on presentation, it's going to be elevated. So therefore, you need to check the potassium values in this person. Option number B says soda bicarbonate. So the main treatment of this guy is not soda bicarbonate. The main treatment of this guy is insulin because it will shut down the production of ketones. Ketones are acidic. Checking blood ketone level. Some people said it was checking urinary ketone level. Doesn't matter. We have already urinary ketones are positive now. So checking ketone levels will not make sense. Soda bicarbonate is not the cure. That is only an emergency scenario. pH is 7.1. pH is 7.0. You can get soda bicarbonate to save it. But it's a temporary measure. Ketones are still being produced. Ketones are highly acidic. How do you shut down the ketone production? Insulin drip. But if a person's BP is low, Standard medical care, lots of guys said, sir, we just applied common sense to the fact that because the BP was less, I had to handle that. And what better than starting the person on IV fluids? 
and checking out the serum potassium values the correct answer for this question is option number d now coming to the next one the question said a uncontrolled diabetes colitis patient presents to the er in an unconscious state the random blood sugar of the patient is 350 mg percent urinary ketones are present which will be done to determine the severity of diabetic ketoacidosis when i'm going to talk about severity of diabetic ketoacidosis the more severe the acidosis is the bicarbonate value of the person will be less a normal bicarbonate value is 20 to 26 let's take two patients one is having bicarbonate value of 20 other is having 15 the person having lower bicarbonate will be having more acidosis option a says urinary ketones the problem with urinary ketones is report will come as plus or plus plus or triple plus so we are using a dipstick you see the problem with i mean why the answer is not option number a is because the urinary ketones are checked by dipstick dipstick is not a quantitative it's not a reliable quantitative estimator serum sodium yeah electrolyte imbalance is seen water because water will be drawn high sugar will draw water water will result in dilution so hyponatremia will occur but then the main problem of this patient is not a electrolyte imbalance it is rather a abg derangement it's a metabolic acidosis so I'm going to check out the plasma bicarbonate values of this patient because blood glucose of this patient is not going to tell me the severity of ketoacidosis. You had to read the word ketoacidosis. So how do you check whether it is ketoacidosis? For ketones, you need to go in for plasma. You see, in this particular question, it would have been very easy for you had he written the word plasma beta hydroxybutrate values. Because the moment you read this word, plasma beta hydroxybutrate values, the higher it is, you can measure it. It means more severe ketoacidosis in a patient. What he did was, however, that he did not give this easy thing of checking out the plasma beta hydroxybutrate. He just wanted you to use common sense in this case that acidosis means bicarbonate values becoming lesser in the patient. Because you see, more bicarbonate, there is alkalosis. Less bicarbonate, there is acidosis, which is why the correct answer for this question would be option number C. Coming to the next question, this I would say or rate it as one of the most difficult questions that came in this particular session. The remaining ones as you would have seen are relatively easy. So let's go through this one also. Dullness to percussion and decreased breath sounds near the base of the left lung. The breath sounds are related to the left lung and they are mainly decreased in the infrascapular area on the back and he says which of the following conditions would be present. First and foremost, you can rule out constrictive pericarditis in a patient because constrictive pericarditis per se results in auscultatory finding of pericardial friction rub or it results in pericardial shudder. But in this particular MCQ is rather talking about breath sounds being reduced in the patient. So it is unlikely that it's going to be a pericarditis because this finding is not given. Pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is related to deep vein thrombosis. So option number B and C are rolled out. We are left between two, cardiac tamponade and left-sided pleural effusion. A lot of guys casually answered this question as left-sided pleural effusion. In left-sided pleural effusion, we always agreed that there would be decreased breath sounds. But what is the percussion note? It is not dull. It is written as stony dull. Please remember and visit the pleural effusion topic. You will notice that it would be a stony dull percussion note occurring in a patient. It's not dull. It is stony dull percussion note, uh, which is why the answer to this question is not D. And if you're wondering how heart would be causing lung manifestation, I mean, the problem is in the heart and lung is getting compressed. So what condition would cause it? Then this condition would be a massive pericardial effusion where this effusion will press on the lung tissue and pressing on the lung tissue will cause decrease in the breath sounds of the patient. So this condition had to be solved by exclusion. I mean, the classical term that is used to describe where the heart presses on the left lung and causes decreased breath sounds and causes a dull note. The dull is because of the pericardial fluid which is present is classically called as Evart sign. Now, Evart sign is something which, which most people are, have not read because this is given in textbook and it is seen in massive pericardial effusion. And nowadays, massive pericardial effusion is usually not seen because we can identify it early on the basis of echocardiography. But because it is classically given in the book, so that is why this question was asked. I mean, the impression, I, I think they have the right to put at least one question which everybody will do wrong. I mean, majority of guys who attempted this focused on only this word, decreased breath sounds in a patient. So, sir, I assume that lungs were getting compressed. That means pleural effusion. But then that dullness to percussion that was described was basically with respect to dullness around the heart of the patient. 
you know when you percuss over the heart is having fluid no so there would be dullness present in plural effusion it is always a stony dullness present so that word was missing one and otherwise you have, could have tried to solve this question by effusion also but i agree that uh, overall this would be one of uh, a difficult ones to crack even in pg entrance the next question said which of the following is the best craft in cabg patient who is diagnosed with triple vessel disease so in this particular chap we will be using artery the performance of a artery is better than a vein a couple of people said it was internal mammary artery given some people said it was internal thoracic artery internal mammary internal thoracic are same suppose suppose this was not given then your answer would be given as radial artery you are putting a blood vessel as a bypass in the heart performance of vein is always inferior as compared to artery and when it comes to the arteries it is radial artery then it is internal thoracic artery and gastroepiphyseal artery which are recommended the because most patients you know if they are undergoing a venous grafting done then they might have to get a, a cbg procedure done again after 10 to 20 years i mean that's a range i mean lot of people having a venous grafting done they might have to do a redo cbg to prevent that nowadays it is arterial graft that are put which will be having a higher performance present which is why the answer to this question is option number c then question said which of the following is not used in non st elevation mi the logic is that in st elevation mi we do thrombolysis but in non st elevation mi thrombolysis is absolutely contraindicated in non st elevation mi it is a rbc obviously in clot there would be rbc but along with rbc it is a platelet rich clot ST elevation MI is a fibrin rich clot because it's a fibrin rich clot we use fibrinolytic but in non ST elevation MI because it's mainly a platelet rich clot so we will be mainly using anti platelet drugs in this patient like clopidogrel we shall be using anti thrombotic drugs aspirin in this patient our objective is to neutralize this platelet rich clot so clopidogrel or instead of clopidogrel we can use ticagrelor heparin and aspirin would be used but what is not going to be used is streptokinase since some people said sir question was not like this the question said which of the following is the preferred drug so the preferred drug to be used in this patient would be heparin we can give low molecular weight heparin to these patients because after all there is a clot which is developing in the coronary artery so i need to get rid of the clot asap as a, as early as possible so low molecular weight heparin would be the preferred treatment to be given in these patients we give obviously we give more also we give morphine oxygen aspirin nitrates anti anti platelet drugs are given but along with that one of the main agents that you will be using in this patient uh, would be enoxaparin it's a anti thrombotic the main objective is anti thrombotic treatment to be given to this patient so the answer would be b the next question said a patient is presented with shortness of breath the chest x ray shows right sided stony dullness on percussion with contralateral tracheal shift so the movement you read stony dullness and then there is a tracheal shift also then you can understand what i am talking about this particular chap the lung is compressed by fluid lot of fluid present here so it's causing stony dullness there is a massive unilateral pleural effusion which in this person is also contributing to a tracheal deviation to the contralateral side i mean the trachea and you and me the suprasternal notch will be central but in this patient the fluid has resulted in pressure on the lung and has also resulted in this mid mediastinal shift also occurring and a tracheal shift also occurring in this patient so the answer would be easier that is pleural effusion and we move on to the last one very said a patient is diagnosed with pleural effusion and adenosine dmns levels are elevated ada the movement you read about adenosine dmns levels in the pleural fluid it's always going to be pleural tuberculosis and the question said that when the doctor did uh, evaluation of this pleural fluid there was elevated ldh and elevated protein he was also trying to describe the lights criteria lights criteria are used to differentiate between transudate and exudate if these ratios are given to be more than 0.6 and 0.5 for ldh more than 0.6 for protein more than 0.5 it means that the person is having a exudate the information that is provided to you are two of them one is told you by help of lights criteria where is talked about ldh values and protein values that it is exudate adenosine dmns it is tuberculosis he says what could you do next in the management of this patient we need to start anti tubercular treatment the correct answer for this question would be option number c why not a sputum because this is pleural tuberculosis no the gauze focus is in the pleura it is causing a pleural effusion so i will be checking whether the i i can do cbnat on the pleural fluid 
the the disease is not involving the lung parenchyma it is involving the covering of the lung it's in the pleura so i will take out the pleural fluid by doing a thoracocentesis and send it for cbnat so the problem with option number d is this word sputum right? if this question said pleural fluid cbnat no issues if he said pleural biopsy being done cbnat no problems because the disease is specifically related to the covering of the lung which is why sputum would not help mantox you very well know mantox is never a diagnostic test Mantox per se is always a prognostic test, which is why option number B is ruled out. We are left between HRCT. Well, I would I can do a CT to find out the extent of pleural effusion, but if already is having diagnosed diagnosis of pleural effusion, the CT will not give any additional information. He must have had a chest X-ray done already. Clinical findings of stony does not would be a result. So towards the end, you saw a couple of questions of respiratory system came up with one specific question of respiratory, which looked like respiratory system. But then in the end result, what we found was that it was having a cardiovascular overlap. So you can add this to your notes also. A difficult information, Evart sign is found in cardiac tamponade. So two questions on cardiac tamponade were present for this particular session. So these are the details that I would like you to remember for uh, FMG June 22 exam. Uh, it was a balanced paper, paper 2 at least. Paper 1 was a slightly on the nastier side, but paper 2, I would say, was more on the balanced side. So I think you guys are going to come out with excellent results. And uh, anyway, for your juniors, do keep on guiding them and telling them to keep hammering and keep learning new, new facts every day so that they become more wiser and they're able to crack the exam in the first go.